far behind. Sorry, Susan. I'm sorry. No, nobody has sent me anything.
Good morning. The September 12th uh, meeting of the Board of Education is now called to order. Please rise for the invocation. O oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance. Stir us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. The pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Item 2.03 is approval of the minutes. And so moved. All right. All right. By consensus, that is approved. Um, item 2.04 is establish agenda order. Mr. Gilliland. Madam President, I move that the board remove item 4.11 concrete for Tyler Heights from the agenda to be considered at a later date. Okay. Do I have a second? Okay. Um, is there any board questions or comments? Okay, Ms. Connolly, would you call the roll? Ms. Urea. Ms. Urea. Yes. Mr. Gilliland. Aye. Mrs. Nally. Yes. Mr. Reinhardt. Aye. Mr. Butcher. Aye. Mr. Granin. Aye. Ms. Korbelak. Aye. Mrs. Hummer. Aye. So um, the agenda stands as amended. Um, item 2.05 is board recognitions. And today we have the pleasure and also the sad duty of recognizing um, Maria Sasso for her time on the board. Maria, if you'd come up front. So um, Maria served us well um, for, uh, for how long, two, two plus years. And she was an outstanding voice um, for especially our um, non-English speakers, our English learners um, for the community. And she was always um, speaking out for the underdog and coming out. And we will miss her very much. Uh, for being on here, so anybody else? Miss Nally. <clears throat> well, Maria and I, um, I, I, we just developed a real relationship. Uh, what I admired about Maria is she always thought, what came prepared, uh, thought through decisions, always looking in the best interest of the children, and uh, and this whole school community but you could know that when Maria spoke she spoke with honesty conviction and a passion um, that I really appreciated we grew to be close we were shopping buddies and we, we were education buddies and um, I will miss your guidance I will miss your opinions and um, I already have so well wishes to you Miss Korbelak Most of us are really bad mind readers, but what I loved about you and love about you is that you always spoke your mind. We never had to guess what was on your mind, and it takes a, it takes a strong and brave woman to do that, and you made us all a little braver, too, and we miss you. And I, we, we have um, our traditional collage plaque for you, but I do want to say, um, from my perspective, thank you. Um, you made this a better board. Um, you made me a better superintendent. Um, you challenged me. Um, as I think most people know, I meet with each board member once a month uh, and our board president once a week, and you always came in with your list. You're ready to go. Our meetings never lasted more than 45 minutes because you had things to do, you had places to go, and we got right to business. Um, and, I, and I appreciated that. You challenged me, you challenged, and, and subsequently you challenged us as a school system to be thinking more broadly about all of our children. Not some, but all of our children. You helped us define in our strategic plan, all means all. And that will carry 
through carry us through the next five years and beyond. And so know that your short time on the board has has meant something. It has been significant. You are significant. And we really very much appreciate everything you've done. So thank you for challenging me. Thank you for challenging us. Ms. Urea. I'm going to miss you as well. I know we haven't known each other for that long, but the, I remember the first time I met you, you like automatically started talking to me, automatically tried to get my opinions, and we started talking about like your real estate and everything. And I really got to know you, and I think it was very heartwarming for me. And you probably gave me one of my favorite t-shirts, the AACPS ones. I, I wear it all the time. I love it. So I'm definitely going to miss you. Mr. Gilliland. Thank you, Madam President, and, and Maria, thank you for the t-shirt as well. Um, <laughs> uh, I, we joined the board together uh, back in 2016, and it's been a delight uh, to, to get to know you, uh, both professionally and personally. Um, you know, when I, um, we, we had just joined the board just uh, two months after, you know, I found out uh, my mom was about to go through a, a tough battle uh, fighting cancer and you were uh, one of the people I confided in significantly during that time and and you know um, you you dealt with it with Sonny and I, I think you know it's conversations that that no one knows about and you were just honest with me throughout that process and told me uh, unfortunately what what I had to look forward to and I will never forget that um, and I think Patty said it very, very well about um, really fighting for the voices that needed to be fought for here. And with that, I'll just say, muchichi mis gracias por su servicio aquí. Mr. Granin. I wasn't sure everybody else was done. I'll be very quick and just say I'm going to miss sitting next to you inside the boardroom. I'm going to miss you as a person. I think we're all going to miss your, your candor. I know I'm personally going to miss your kindness, and I think that you really personified what we should all strive for here, which is to speak our minds and vote our convictions, and I'm going to miss you. you park up front for the last day. <laughs> well, let's start with thank you. For over two and a half years that I served, it was truly an honor to represent the educational needs of the children in Anne Arundel County. And the shirts that I gave everybody, if, you know, I know you probably haven't seen them, but some of the administration has. In the middle, what it really says is county, okay? And that is, I thought about that, and it was really because when the new board starts coming in, it is not the individual representing their little area, but we have to think about the children throughout the whole county. So I would like to see that eventually, you know, this board basically reflects the county and not what every individual thinks that they want. It was also an eye-opening experience to serve at the national level and see that the educational programs and the administrative services of our county perform at a higher level than most other counties throughout the United States, if not all other counties in the nation. We truly rock. You know, a lot of people do not know, you know, we're just here and everybody talks about this, but when I served at the national level, I mean, you can see, you know, and you go, why aren't they doing that? You know, it's just so easy. We truly rock. We really do. I worked with truly dedicated board members, such as Miss Patty, Terry, Colin, Sydney, and under the leadership of two superbly dedicated presidents, Stacy and Julie, and an incredible Molly, okay, and our board chief of staff and her assistant, Diane, a magnificent superintendent. And don't be mistaken, once again at the national level, you see others and you go, Oh my God, aren't we lucky? <laughs> okay. okay, the best that Maryland has and the best that the United States has. I really mean it. 
okay? And his dedicated and professional staff. I mean, all of you out there that I went down today, I really take off my hat for what you do for this county. Above all, <clears throat> the board in which I served was truly a nonpartisan and a nonpolitical professional board. And I want that to be known because this is not a Democratic board and this is not a Republican board. This is really a board that works for the benefit of the children. To the future board applicants that come and the members of the board, I can only advise to be prepared to work if you truly aim to represent the children of this county and know that your personal agenda may not be realized if financial appropriations are not feasible. And didn't we find out that? Okay, as a board member, your fiduciary responsibility to the children and the citizens of the country will be budget, 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 okay? And it takes hours to read it and to decipher it. It's not just getting that mass little thing and coming to the board and then figuring it out, what the heck are they talking about? Okay, thank you all that put up with me and may our paths cross. All right, um, next is item 2.06, which is school and community highlights. So, any board members? So, Ms. Urea. Well, I just wanna say that CRASC had our first meeting of the year last week, so we're excited to just jump off the year with everything we have planned, so, yeah. Mr. Reinhardt. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Uh, so last week is, is always my favorite week uh, in terms of board service. Um, it's, it's an excuse to get out and see as many children as possible and uh, sometimes break away from the group and do a little teaching. So that's, <laughs> it's always, that's always fun. Um, my, my favorite part of, of doing the back to school visits uh, in, the, in the elementary schools is being able to see, as, as we just mentioned with Maria, all of our students. Uh, and the wide variety in beautiful campuses, beautiful classrooms, and the beautiful children that we do serve uh, here in Anne Arundel County. Um, the, the passion that we saw exhibited, the opportunities we had to participate in those community circles and, and watch the restorative, uh, that, that initial uh, restorative justice taking place and setting those seeds for the conversation those children are gonna have for, for the next decade, uh, it's, it's just a really special time. Uh, so hats off to all the teachers that we got to visit, and uh, I'm as as my term rolls off, that's that's something I'm certainly going to miss. So I'll have to find another way back into the classroom, I suppose. <laughs> and we will certainly find a way to bring you back in the classroom. I there vacancy. Yes, we're going to put you to work. Put you to work. So yes, I yes. thoroughly enjoyed all of the um, school visits last week. Um, 
We had some special visitors. The governor came out on the first day of school and was present at Watch Chapel for the opening day and greeting students. And um, <laughs> Dr. Orlato and I and several other board members and um, Mr. Leone from, the, from TAC, we all went around to a great number of schools and it was, it was exciting to see everything that's going on. I personally have already gone to two back to school nights and I will make the complaint again that they scheduled two of my schools for the same night, so my husband and I had to divide and conquer. So, Dr. Arlotto, what you doing? But um, <laughs> I just not, have not scheduling back to school nights. Uh, right. <laughs> There you go. And I just have too many kids and too many schools, so it's my own fault. But I did get to go to two of them and had um, great things <laughs> going on. Um, I also had the pleasure Monday night of attending the Citizens Advisory Council, um, the first meeting of the year. And for those who don't know, that's an advisory board for the an advisory council for the Board of Education made up of two parent, two representatives from every cluster in the school system as well as some other members as well representing our special education community, the PTA, um, the military community, and it's just an amazing group of really dedicated um, citizens that r are really w willing to tackle some big issues to advise this, the um, Board of Education, and so it was a great way to start the, start the year, to kick off with them on um, Monday night. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing what they're, what they're gonna come back to us with this year and how we can move forward with that. So, and now, hold on, I don't have my papers together. Um, now we will, well, so, oh, I'm sorry, CAC report. So I was just talking about you, Brandon, and I was about to skip you. Morning, board. Morning. Dr. Alato. Um, yeah, we had a great meeting. I uh, had our first meeting Monday night. Um, Madam President was out with us, which was awesome to have her voice in the room and that sort of thing. Uh, we did an orientation with some of the new members, um, which was great to see their energy and their excitement for the new year. It's my first year as chair, so I'm very excited as well. I've got my own ideas of what we need to be working on and what we can do. Um, a lot of what was discussed was the capital budget, which is gonna be rolling out and some of the things around that. Um, redistricting came up, um, especially with the Crofton High School situation. So. So that was kind of a neat conversation. One of the big topics was the water and the lead testing. Uh, that came up before when we were still in orientation and it came up again and um, you know, the feedback that we got from Madam President about that whole process and what's involved in that and the time that goes into that was extremely valuable. Um, so our clusters now have a chance, our cluster representatives have a chance to get that information out to the community. Um, I know I'm getting emails about it as well. Um, so the fact now that we have 30 people basically who will be able to be another voice in what's going on with that I think is gonna be huge. Uh, recess also came up. Uh, discussions around guidelines related to recess and how recess should be working and whether or not it can be used as a punishment and that sort of thing. Um, so that was also a really good conversation to have. And again, the ability to give that feedback back to the schools and the parents and, and help them know what's going on. And then there was a very light discussion on security enhancements, but I have a feeling that'll continue to be a, a hot topic as we move through the year. So our focus for this year, um, A, will be on increasing communication. Um, we wanna see the CAC role grow in the community. Um, too much of people going, what is the CAC? Um, so I wanna get more people who know what our role is and where we fit and really what we do. Um, and it's not advocacy, it's advice and, and that sort of thing. So making sure that people understand our role. Um, and then the other thing is, is really putting a lot more emphasis on the training. Um, we, we bring on a lot of great speakers, um, but I think we need to do a lot of training with the different representatives. They're all citizens. Um, and they're all learning things too. And I think we, we uh, especially in the chair role, need to do a lot more to, to train and develop them. So, so that's kind of our focus this year, uh, is to really get our, our message out there and our role out there so that we can be a better liaison between the community and you guys at the board. So, cool. Okay. Thanks guys. We appreciate it. So. All right, um, next is public comment. Anyone wishing to speak on an item not on today's agenda and who has signed up prior to the board establishing the agenda order a few minutes ago may offer testimony during this public comment portion of the meeting. 
Speakers are allotted three minutes each and may not allocate their time to others. A tone will sound when time has expired. The board asks that comments remain civil and appropriate for the various audiences that may be watching or viewing this meeting. Student specific and personnel matters are confidential and cannot be discussed in this forum. It is not the board's general practice to engage in question and answer session with speakers. Questions may be posed by speakers, but any answers will count as part of the three minute limit. For the record, please give your name before speaking. Handouts should be given to the board assistant. If you did not sign up in time to speak today, you may submit written testimony to the board's assistant today or via email at any time. And we have th three um, people, Lisa Van Buskirk, Dana Schalheim, and Victoria Calhoun. Good morning, Board of Education, Superintendent Alala, Lisa Van Buskirk, Start School Later, Anne Arundel County. Between the first day of school and this past Monday, the first pickup times of every single Annapolis and Broadneck High School bus changed, some by two minutes and some by 10, 20, or even 30 minutes, both earlier and later. Meanwhile, Arundel, Mead, Northeast, Severna Park, South River, and Southern High School had no changes to their posted schedules. Chesapeake, Glen Burnie, North County, Old Mill had only one change. An example of Annapolis High School change from a PDA parent who's a uh, Special bus picks up near Mead uh, Middle School. After gaining almost 30 minutes before needing to get to the bus, my daughter missed the bus because they changed the day on, on day three of school from a 643 bus to apparently a 625 bus without any communication. Needless to say, as a single mom, that was very difficult for us. Anyways, today the bus arrived at 620 and departed at 622, so it didn't even stay and wait until the 625. I guarantee others missed it. Many of the comments on social media last week appeared to be a round robin of finger pointing on why some buses were skipping routes um, or 30 minutes or even 30, minute, 30 minutes early or 30 minutes late. The schools blamed transportation department, transportation department blamed companies, companies blamed individual drivers. So then it begs the question who's really in charge. So an example of the bus driver um, blaming somebody else is, uh, this is from a North County STEM bus um, student. My daughter had a chat with the driver yesterday and he told her that he was told by AACPS to follow the same schedule pickup as two years ago before the 13, 15 minute switch, even though school starts later. He said he put in a request this year to move the first stop 15 minutes later and all the other stops 10 minutes later. AACPS has not yet responded to his request. Um, some bus drivers are saying they're free to make up their own schedules and others are saying they can't change without AACPS uh, control. So I think we need to do a better job of communicating with our bus drivers and our parents. So an example of how to better communicate with our parents about our bus schedules is to follow the lead of Prince George's County who this year instituted a smartphone app called Here Comes the Bus. Here Comes the Bus is just one of 17 smartphone apps available that use the GPS signal from the bus and the GPS signal, all your buses are GPS enabled to work with the software that you have. And so the students and the parents can just look at their app and see when the bus is coming. So I urge you to consider looking at, at that as you consider the next budget cycle to see if that could be implemented next year. That'd be great, not just the first week of school, but when there's other winter storms and all those other things. I think that would be a great use of technology for us. The current list of routes uh, no longer include arrival times because they are, quote, too confusing for parents, according to Mr. Douglas. I don't know if that confusion was because they were asking why are buses arriving 30 minutes before the bell. He promised that some of these times would be added, added back onto the routes, and then I'll update you. But I want to talk about bus 874 to the Harbor School. Um, my daughter is a special needs and has been at the Harbor School for eight years, so we know the routine well. They're picking her up 20 minutes earlier this year, and they started in August without any new kids added. Pickup is at 6.45 for an 8.20 start time, and the school is 11 miles away. They used to pick up at 7 or 5 or even 7.15. The bus driver told the kids that he had to be first in line because of the next run. He then turned the bus off, and the kids were roasting in the bus over 20 minutes in the heat of the last two weeks. And one of the students had two seizures on the bus because of the heat. Now, luckily, due to the involvement of the student's lawyer, the air conditioning has been fixed. But it does beg the question of why is that school bus arriving so early with special needs students? So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Buskirk. Mr. Butcher. Madam President, I know you've stressed that we're not supposed to re respond to public comments, but I just want to make sure that as we're starting the school year that we're very clear. Um, Dr. Alato, do, does the board have any control over the bus schedule? No, they don't. That's my responsibility. All right. So if an individual has any recommendations or suggestions or problems or issues or concerns, who is the appropriate person within your administration for them to contact? So we'll, we ask, and, and we had this conversation several weeks ago, Mr. Butcher, so I appreciate you bringing it up as we're starting the school year or now into week two. 
um, that it starts at the school level. They could let their principal know. The principal then knows the chain of command with whoever the transportation supervisor is for their area. It can go to Mr. Douglas. If it gets called here in the central office, we'll make sure that that call and that concern gets routed to the appropriate person so we can review the times, the schedule, those sorts of things. My final request would be that these apps that Lisa uh, just highlighted, can we um, at least take a look at into those, or could your administration take a look we into We will. Them? I made a note of it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ms. Schulheim. Good morning, board. Good to see you. Um, I wanted to express my disappointment. Um, firstly, for the record, I'm Dana Schulheim. Um, I wanted to express my disappointment about testing that occurred on Monday, which was Rosh Hashanah. Um, two different middle schools um, had testing the Gates testing. I believe that's a middle school language arts uh, assessment. Uh, that happened for sure at Severn River Middle School and at Severna Park Middle School. Um, according to the uh, calendar that you all uh, approved, it states very, very clearly in black and white that tests and, and exams are not supposed to occur on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Eid al-Fatir um, at a, a minimum. And uh, these things did happen. This is the second year in a row that these things have happened. They happened last year, too. I find it... Um, bizarre that it happened again on Rosh Hashanah because as you all know Rosh Hashanah falls on the lunar you know uses the lunar calendar and it is more likely for me to be struck by lightning right here than it is for Rosh Hashanah to occur on the same day two years in a row so this was an intentional or at least um, more than a coincidental um, uh, scheduling of these exams um, one parent told me at temple on Monday because I am Jewish um, that the student was going to be made to make up that exam either during class time where they would miss instructional time or during lunch, which we think we can all agree would be a punishment. And this is wholly inappropriate. So I, I just want to stress again that these policies need to be not just communicated to staff and to all principals, but enforced. Um, these holidays are very um, holy. Um, students and staff um, need to be out uh, to uh, observe them and to not be held, res you know, uh, responsible for making up tests and exams that are against the stated policy on the approved calendar. So, like I said before, this happened yet last year. My rabbi called uh, and complained of her daughter experiencing this last year at one of the schools. It's happened this year at at least two middle schools. This cannot happen again. This needs to be communicated properly and enforced wholly. Um, it's not okay. So I just wanted to state that. Thank you. Dr. Arlott. Yes, if, just to inform the board, um, uh, and I very much appreciate Ms. Schalheim bringing this to our attention. Uh, I understand this was uh, at issue at an, at an evening community meeting last night. Um, I was able to meet with several members of our team this morning to talk about it. Um, uh, it is clearly stated uh, on our calendar, and we've, we've, we've put that out there to our principals over the last several years that assessment should not be going on. I think what has occurred um, is the definition of assessment. Um, a Gates assessment does not, it, it is a diagnostic tool used in the classroom. Um, just as questions and answers might be used as a diagnostic tool in the, in the classroom or an exit ticket at the end of at the end of a class period. Um, it does not impact the student. They were not to prepare for it the night before. It's not like it was a physics test or a math test or an English test where they had needed to prepare for it or could impact their grade. So Michelle, I'm absolutely right that we need to make sure that we're very clear with our folks. It may be a matter of uh, maybe a matter of definition for us. I don't know that the teachers did it explicitly uh, uh, to to punish any student. Um, they were, they use that the Gates assessment in the middle school is a diagnostic assessment in reading, um, just as questions and answers might be uh, during a lesson. And so we will certainly talk. Uh, our principals will be meeting this month, and we'll go over this again with our principals. Calhoun. My name is Victoria Calhoun. I stand here today as a parent as my two daughters have transitioned to middle school and both PTAs are still forming. I have come here today to speak to the board and all the citizens of Anne Arundel County to let them know that the mechanisms to support public input and engagement to this body and the Kerwin Commission have been a facade. 
The records of both bodies show I have actively participated to provide detailed input to both bodies recommending the use of information age cost modeling instead of an obsolete funding formula and, and, and I've also provided significant input to this body in the form of the strategic planning process. In both cases, my input was systematically and bureaucratically lost. I recently wrote the governor to tell him that both bodies have not complied with open government requirements and have not operated in accordance with their established policy. Genuine public engagement today must be in the form of collaboration in the production of policy and planning, not smoke and mirrors. But that requires a genuine shift of power and decision making to the front lines of parents, guardians, teachers, staffs, and principals. It demands public servants possess new skills as enablers, negotiators, and collaborators. These appear to be currently absent. Several families and friends from my neighborhood have been forced to move, and some have chosen to homeschool their kids because of poor school performance. As today's children's education is sacrificed to false promises and gaps in education, which are really craters, I strongly urge the citizens of this county to vote for new board, board members who will operate this board in a manner that pursues improvements in our schools that we all desire. Thank you. Um, next items are consent items, award of contracts. Do I have a motion to bundle items 4.01 through 4.25? Okay, Ms. Connolly, would you call the roll? Ms. Urea? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mrs. Nally? Aye. Mr. Reinhardt? Aye. Mr. Mr. Butcher? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Corblack? Aye. Mrs. Hummer? Aye. That's eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative. All right. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation? Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, I recommend the Board of Education award contracts as listed on today's agenda, 4.01 through 4.25, excluding 4.11. Okay. Um, so, do I have a second? Okay. Are there any board questions or comments on any of these items? I actually have one. So I see that um, item 4.25 is for a contract for the SAT and PSAT. Um, I, I know the past couple of years we had um, been giving the ACT at schools and is there now going to be a shift back to the SAT? Yes, ma'am, thank you for that question. The answer is yes. <clears throat> we have, um, our history is that we have not as a school system um, uh, been exclusive with any um, uh, college admissions tests, to use those terms loosely. Um, students have been welcome to take and prepare for either the SAT or the, or the ACT at their so choosing. Um, what we did as a system over the years is we paid for our students to be engaged with the PSAT as freshmen, as sophomores, and as juniors. Um, this board has seen some attendance data over the years and whether that was really effective. So two years ago, after looking at the data for, an, for a year under the guidance of Mr. Dykstra, who's sitting before you and his team, uh, we chose to undertake the, the ability to test all of our juniors and give them an, an ACT that you, this board, this, this administration paid for, and that we would look at it for a two-year period. So we broke our contract with the college board and with the PSAT in order to make this a zero sum game, uh, a, a zero cost, um, we, we shifted those funds to pay for the ACT for all of our juniors. We reviewed the data again under Mr. J, uh, under Mr. Dykstra's leadership and have decided that our students fare better on the SAT. We also believe there's more preparation out there, uh, free preparation uh, for the SAT with Khan Academy and others. Um, as well as several other reasons. And so in this contract, we've gone back to the college board, talked to them about going back to the SAT. And in the contract, this will also include the PSAT. So we will test all of our juniors for free with the PSAT in the fall, beginning this fall, and all of our juniors with the SAT in the spring for free. 
We'll be doing away with the ACT. This will cause some consternation with some folks that it started the preparation process. We realize that. That does not exclude them from taking the a ACT. But we as a, you as a board, and that's what this contract is about, is to now supply the SAT. And we got with that contract the PSAT. Um, and some that which we believe is good diagnostic good diagnostic tool for our juniors um, uh, beginning this school year so that's what this contracts about if you've got specific questions mr. Dykstra's can can answer those for you sounds good to me are there any other board questions or comments okay. I just have a question yes um, I don't know who can answer this but is there any reason why we would think that students would do better on the SAT preferably on, then on the ACT good morning for the record Jason Dykstra executive director of instructional data awesome question um, the research that we did was really around performance so we didn't get into reasons that what might inform that we did uh, dr. Gillens and I actually did some focus groups and we went to several high schools and met with students um, and it was very enlightening and it was very interesting that based on that feedback from our focus groups we really found out that the students felt um, a tremendous time crunch, particularly uh, with the English and the reading sections of mm -hmm. ACT, yes. uh, 75 questions in whatever, 50 minutes or something crazy. Um, they also felt like their English class was better aligned. Uh, but again, that's anecdotal feedback, mm -hmm. but we did go to multiple high schools and spoke to multiple students. But the data that we looked at was really uh, performance-based. We compared okay. last year's, uh, two years ago's juniors to this year's juniors. We took a look at the ACT benchmarks versus the CCR thresholds. We compared ACT to SAT, and we also looked at students who only took the ACT uh, in our recommendation to Dr. Arlato. So you ask a great question. Why would that be in Anne Arundel County? It's a very good question, but what we do know definitively is overall students in Anne Arundel County, um, whether you look at uh, the benchmarks for college admission or we look at the CCR thresholds um, our students do better on SAT okay and I have a follow-up question too um, so would we just be eliminating the ACT and just providing the SAT instead students can still take the ACT that's not a problem we'll on we their still own money though right? correct okay. correct yeah so um, but the school system um, with the approval of this contract would pay for all of our juniors to take the PSAT on October 10th and the SAT on March 27th during the school day. Okay, um, and is there any data that shows, because um, I know a lot of the technical colleges, um, as prefer uh, preferably like engineering colleges, like the ACT just because it has that STEM and- um, The science component. The science component. Mm -hmm. Now, is there any like data that could show that this would hinder students that only take the SAT given by us? Right. No, the answer is no, but we work okay. with our student services team to double check that. And okay. all colleges and universities, regardless of their specialty or focus, take either of the college okay. admissions tests. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. You're welcome. Any other board questions or comments? All right. We do have some public comment on some of these agenda items. Um, Victoria Calhoun on item 4.02. Yes, ma'am. As I was looking over the information that was posted on the website, again, I thought it was completely devoid of any really valuable information except for the cost. So I went to the First in Math website, and uh, it looks like they have uh, mass numbers of what the cost is. It appears that the cost for this software would be $7.25 per student. I would like to see that that information actually be in the information that's available to the public because as it was portrayed for this meeting, I, I couldn't see how you were making any sort of decision. But given that this is supposed to be for the third, fourth, and fifth graders, it looks to me like you're overpaying at 725 a student. You almost can give this software to every student. So I, don't, I know there was teacher support packages in there, but again, I couldn't see that. There was a complete lack of transparency on that. It says it's all in the contracting stuff. And I understand you don't want to get all the information bogged down in the front matter that's available to the people that are, that are witnessing this um, deliberation. But at 725 a student, it seems like that's a lot of money. All right. Um, next is item four. Okay, I will call in just a moment. Yes, it's kind of, it's um, 
after the the cards that we have, then we'll come back to that. To have. Um, next is item 4.05, CT Electrical. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to voice our concerns. I work for Electrical Contractor in Davidsonville, which is in Anne Arundel County, um, small business. We were the apparent low bidder on Tyler Heights Elementary School and also Edgewater. There was a clerical order, I'm sorry, a clerical error on our MBE paperwork, and we were not awarded the job. We are in the middle of a takeover, um, one of the vice presidents leaving, a new one's coming in. We have two jobs, and they're ending, and we have nowhere to send our men. We met with Esther Avery and Vincent O'Brien in regards to this, and Esther Avery was very persistent that it cannot be changed, but there are things in that Governor Hogan, um, Lieutenant Governor, they are changing under the Comar Act that there can be um, revisions made to these forms once the bid is turned in. Esther Avery and Vincent O'Brien admittedly sat there and said that this is counting costing the public school system because of these forms millions of dollars in construction. And CT Electric has a problem with that because I'm a taxpayer and everybody in here is probably Anne Arundel County taxpayers and state taxpayers. That Anne Arundel County is wasting money just because the MBE paperwork is not correctly filled out. When it is in the process of being changed under Comar 21.11.03, um, it is in the Governor Office of Small Minority and Women Business Affairs, and the language is the change. We got that information from Ellen Robertson, Department of General Services. Back in 2016, Governor Hogan issued an executive order, 01.01.2016.05, that it was a commission to modernize state procurement. When there's also Comar Rule 21.06.02.04 that states minor regularities on bids can be changed if allowed. And Anne Arundel County evidently, evidently does not follow Comar rules, but these are state funded projects. They are wage scale projects. So I don't know why they pick and choose what they wanna follow. But it all was also recommended by Lieutenant Governor back in December of 2016 that they, uh, on page 18 of his report, 3.6, that allowed changes to be made to these MBE participation forms. It was a clerical error. It was a mathematical error asking for a waiver. So now between these two projects that were being awarded to companies that are not even in Anne Arundel County, that are both in Baltimore County, I believe, um, it is costing the, the state, the county, $65,000 more to award to, project, to uh, companies that were correct on their forms. Thank you. Ms. Dr. Also, I, I'm sorry. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off there. Um, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this board is cannot, um, and I'm going to advise them not to respond to your comments okay. because you're going through the process of an appeal. I checked earlier yes, today, your appeal yes, is in process. Mm -hmm. You've submitted the paperwork. That appeal could come to this board, so I'm gonna ask the board to not respond okay. um, because you are in the appeal process. I do wanna make a, because you made the, the blanket statement that AACPS doesn't follow Comar, that's just simply incorrect. We do follow Comar in, in, in all aspects of the running of this school system from the board and the superintendent and this team, and in particular in the area of facilities, budget uh, um, uh, and awarding of contracts, we do follow Comar. Well, then I suggest you let purchasing know that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Granin. I just have a question. I'm trying to get everything in the business, but I appreciate that. I just want to make sure I could understand all your comments. Did your comments go to the entirety of the contracts at issue in 4.05 or just for Okay. As was stated, this is under appeal, and we shouldn't, we really should not be asking questions about the specific. I, 
I don't believe that that is a proper question to ask when the, you, the, when the case is under appeal and it would come up and that would be the time that Dr. that would Arlotta, be clarified. Do, is the entirety I, of 4.05 at issue in the appeal or just two of the kind of, that It's 4.5 and 4.13, Tyler Heights, both jobs. Thank you, ma'am. That's Ms. Korbelak. Uh, Dr. Arletta, should we pull 05 and 13 while it's under appeal or we, is it okay for us to? vote on this today I'm I, I moved it I'm suggesting that you vote on it and move it forward because that has been the that's our process thank you so are there any other public comments about any um, of the contracts bundled in 4.01 through 4.25 good morning uh, Janet Norman Annapolis High parent and an upside graduate parent. Um, uh, I think this is very interesting about the SAT versus the ACT. Uh, it would have been great for the uh, for the high school PS um, parent student associations to know about this contract. Uh, part of the difficulty is your uh, lack of transparency of changes that are going on in the high school, um, and not letting the parent the involved parents know. Um, I, I wonder uh, how we, how these decisions are made without without input. Are you considering that the um, the SAT is given internationally, and the August SAT, if you read about it, had se severe problems with uh, international cheating? And if you look up it, Google Google China SAT, and you will get a Reuters story from two years ago about the massive amounts of fraud in the SAT. Um, that affect our students. And the ACT, I believe, is only given in the U.S. and does not have that degree of, of fraud associated with it. Um, my student took both the June and August SAT score um, tests. Um, I think there's benefit to having the ACT and having the students um, get exposed to that alternate, uh, that alternate test. Many of them commonly take the SAT so that they know which one they might be able to afford to retake after it. Um, it might be too late to take. The, I think paying for the PSAT might be a waste of money um, because it's only used for national merit scholarship determinations, and the bar is incredibly high for Maryland. Um, I think if you have limited resources, you should reconsider and get more involvement from your high schools uh, to, to make this decision um, before you unilaterally implement it. Um, the other thing, I, if, if I had been allowed to speak at the, at the opening public testimony, which you have changed the rules to not allow me, I'm taking quality vacation time from my job in order to be here, and many other people can't do that. Um, but I was not allowed to speak early this morning. I want to tell you that I commend you for the selection of the acting principal at Annapolis High. Um, Mr. Patrick Gelinas is an excellent choice to, um, we sadly are missing our phenomenal Ms. Chittam. But um, we we Ms. thank you for Ms. your Nor selection. Thank you, Ms. Norman. Uh, if, Dr. If, I, if I could, uh, members of the board, to clarify, we are not paying anything additional for the PSAT. That was part of the negotiated contract with College Board that they would include that with the cost of the SAT. Um, let me also, uh, because I, I um, didn't share all the uh, key variables in that decision, and there were many. One of the variables that we have to consider is what is known as CCR, um, which is the college and career readiness tag that each one of our students must now meet by legislation. Um, and with that, there are certain benchmarks a student must reach by the end of their junior year. That might be changing based on the current cushion. By the end of their junior year, they must meet certain benchmarks. Um, uh, and um, uh, with that, um, uh, the SAT is one of those benchmarks that we felt that um, we can better support our students and the data was supporting our students who are faring better um, in comparison to the SAT as well as the park assessment. And, and so we believe we'll have more students achieving that CCR benchmark. All right, is there any other public comment on these items? Okay, Mr. Grainer. Say that I would further move that uh, the board defer action on those two contracts for at least 30 days. 
And if that motion does not prevail, then I move to unbundle those items so that they can at least get an up or down vote. So what is your first motion? That seems uh, my, to be more my, than one. My, Okay. My first motion is to unbundle items 4.05 and 4.13 so that they can be independently voted on. Okay. Do I have a second? A second. Okay. Ms. Connolly, would you call the roll? Oh, Ms. I'm sorry. Is there, I'm sorry. Is there any board comment on unbundling items 4.05 and 4.13? Mr. Gillen. I, I did have a question that I wanted to ask, and I, I guess it's just a, a question of whether it's more appropriate to talk about this during the unbundling process or if we vote. Because I'm, I'm assuming if this motion passes, we'll be able to discuss. But if the motion fails, we won't be able to discuss. So I hope I'm not out of order by asking a question or two right now. I, I guess is where um, if we were not, uh, and I'll make an assumption, and, and Dr. Arlotto, if it's okay, I don't know if Mr. Shaknovich uh, would, would be an appropriate person to ask these questions to. Um, if 4.05 and 4.13 were to theoretically uh, be held, or hypothetically be held today, um, what would our timeline uh, be for the construction, uh, or at least the impact of these two projects? vis-a-vis -vis construction timelines. Sure, for the record, uh, Alex Shack knows Chief Operating Officer. We do, uh, we're fully ready at all these sites. We've mobilized, we've got our permits, our construction managers are in place. And in fact, we've already begun a lot of preparatory activities. Uh, so we're, uh, we've got a timeline and these are both critical elements uh, that occur during early phase or some portion of these contracts happen in the early phases of the contract. So uh, a delay couldn't, could in fact, impact the delivery date of both of those school projects. And, and then I, I want to be careful how I word this question because I know an appeal is in process at, 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 at this point. Um, but if there were to be a, a change subsequent to the outcome of the appeal, either here or, or beyond here, you know, potentially at the state level, um, if, if, if that um, action were to occur, um, what then and again, this probably gets into some hypotheticals, but what then would happen to a project that's midstream if, if work is to have already begun? Um, and again, I, I don't know if, I'm trying to ask this in a general way. Um, so, so uh, I can't answer that because the remedy would be as prescribed in the order that's delivered from the courts or the order that's delivered from a, a state board or appellate body. So um, I, I can't answer a hypothetical with a hypothetical. The, the remedy would be as prescribed by either a governmental body or a judicial body. I, I, I have more questions that I, I'd like to ask, but I, I think just in given the appeals in, in, in progress, I, I, I'm afraid to ask those questions at this point, so I'll just I'll pause there. Mr. Butcher. Uh, yes, Mr. Butcher. Uh, to be frank, I found the presentation from the executive from CT Electric to be uh, coherent and professional and very detailed. And uh, perhaps because of this appeal process, there wasn't a lot of uh, response to what was said. And it sounds like some, uh, you know, bureaucratic red tape about a, a form uh, is stopping the county from getting the, uh, the best deal that it should on these contracts and there hasn't been a response made in response to that. And to say that, you know, it's just gonna be addressed by an appeal. If we, if we lose the appeal, uh, the work will already have been started by a party who should not have on the merits won that work. And there will be uh, presumably some damages owed to CT Electric. That doesn't seem like the, the proper course. If they say that they should have gotten the work, I've been up here for two years. I've not seen any private contractor come forward and make a presentation with that type of professionalism as to why they should have been awarded a contract, and I, I, I think we should reconsider that. My, my final question is, if this is so timely for purposes of needing to try to approve the contract now, I mean, it's, this is not hypothetical. This is what's happened. We have a situation where there's a, a potential appeal. Is there not a way that we can get these um, before us earlier to avoid this type of issue? No, they're brought to you as timely as, as possible. 
Um, the other piece for <clears throat> for the board is that there is a little bit of a, a timing issue in that the contracts aren't entered into this evening. So contracts that involve state school construction need the authorization from the board. That is what your vote would provide. They also need to be approved by the state, by the uh, IEC, the Interagency Commission on School Construction. So there is some time lag associated with your prospective adoption and then the state uh, has a role to play before the contracts are entered into. So there is a window of time that that the uh, appeals process can transpire in. Is there a way to expedite that or not? No. I, I mean, again, we are going to act on it with utmost haste at our level. The process is you appeal to the uh, purchasing officer. That's the process stipulated in Comar. If you do not agree with the decision of the purchasing officer, you appeal to the office of the superintendent. Uh, the office of the superintendent obviously can uh, render a decision in the case. If you do not agree with the office of the superintendent, you will appeal to the local board, you sitting as a board. So you are in the appeals process. That's why you have to be careful uh, with any discussions regarding contractual appeals. Uh, once an, an, a, an, a decision is rendered by you, then the appeal goes to the state board. And after the state board, it would enter the court system. Are we at least allowed to know how timely the appeal process started for this particular contract? Uh, we were notified, I think, within the past 48 hours. Okay. And when was the decision made for purposes of this, to, for this particular contract, who it was going to be awarded to? It was made uh, Tuesday, a week ago. Okay. And when was the woman that stood before us, when was she notified that she would not get the contract, or there was an issue with the paperwork or whatever? Before that date. Mr. Reinhardt. For the record, Darren Burns, uh, board council, and just to clarify, uh, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Alato, as board counsel, of course, I represent uh, in any you know appellate or lit litigation matter the Board of Education itself as a body. So my comments to you are directly related to the processes and laws that apply to you as a board. Mr. Zagnovich, of course, uh, as being on superintendent staff, also has access to attorneys, and up to a certain point, till Dr. Uh, Arlato makes a decision, they are advised independently of your counsel as to how to proceed. I do think it's important to understand that there was an early concern about not delving too far into an active piece of litigation as part of your bundled contracts award. And I think that was well taken guidance from whoever suggested it, and I would reiterate it. Second is understand that you as a board have a longstanding procurement policy and regulations developed by the superintendent consistent with 5.112 of the education article which requires competitive bidding and requires award to lowest responsible responsive bidders. That's a state law. When it comes to construction of facilities, you are governed in part by the regulations from the Board of Public Works through the IAC, through the Public School Construction Program, the very same folks who issue the MBE regulations. So while there may be a dispute in issue, Mr. Zaknovitz has alluded to some timelines, which are all fairly recent, you have a policy that unless you unanimously vote to suspend it, applies to how bid protests are heard. And my caution would be is, if you step outside of your normal procedures without first going through that step, then you have violated policy. Second is, you would be entering into the merits of a dispute without even understanding what the case may be about. And I can tell you as board counsel, I wouldn't know what the dispute's about because it hasn't risen to your level yet. It has, in fact, it has not risen to the superintendent's level. So I just would reiterate that caution from whoever first issued it as you go through the motions to, to unbundle and or to consider and or to put anything on hold, just understand that at the other end of this equation, you have policies that govern through law and regulation how you handle bid protests in order to meet the requirements of Section 5-112 of the Education Article. 
and if I could just piggyback on that, Mr. Shaknovich, did the purchasing office follow all of those rules and regulations as laid out and stipulated by board council? Yes. Mr. Reinhardt. I thank you, Madam President. Mr. Burns, uh, should the appeal reach the level of the board, would, and, and this is uh, it's hypotheticals, right? That's where we are right now. So, and if we were to uphold the current award, could our vote today to unbundle be used by the appellant at the state level or wherever it then proceeds after us as as some form that we were con we were considering or were showing concern uh, regarding the issue generally speaking all you're doing in, un in unbundling and all, all all that i think mr grant's motion would say on its face is simply that rather than uh, all in a bunch, all in a bundle, contracts being approved for award, you're separating your discussion. So, so the mere fact that two, two items who happen to be this, uh, related to uh, contract awards who are subject to bid disputes, the fact that they're taken separate from the rest of those contracts in and of itself wouldn't be something that either side, would, I think, could take advantage of. However, if you were to approve an unbundling and then got into a discussion uh, into the details and facts of the merits of the superintendent's recommendation on 4.05 and 4.13, then I could see either party potentially making use of whatever discussion occurred today. And again, it would be, if it went that far, outside of your own policies and procedures for bid protest. There's a, there is a, as rare is there a case where there's not a remedy at some point for whoever claims to have been wronged, uh, who if indicated, you know, can't obtain some relief whether that's through monetary damages, whether it's a reverse of an award and a reaward, whether it's an order to go out to bid, as Mr. Zaknovich said, the end, there's, there's a, a wide variety of possibilities of where litigation could go. But it's at the beginning stages here, and, and whether you bundle or unbundle your consideration of these contracts, I would just, again, reiterate the caution that content-wise, you should not be discussing the merits of the superintendent's recommendation as relates to the bid protest. And Mr. Chaknovich, uh, in, in terms of the Gantt chart for this program, uh, for this project, um, or both projects that are in question, um, how's this going to affect the critical path for the construction of those two buildings? Well, again, there there are cer certain elements of the work that of the work that are front loaded that are uh, required sequentially in order to allow later stages to to work. So essentially, it, you know, if you push back the front, you push back basically the, the entire job, or you risk having to uh, resequence or possibly pay accel acceleration charges, et cetera. Um, there's also other contract packages that are uh, awaiting prior work to happen sequentially before later work. So impacting one trade package could have a domino effect of impacting other contractors who now potentially also could have their work schedules uh, altered in some manner. So then what I hear you say is every, every day of this appeal process is a, a day lost on site. Not necessarily the appeal process. No? We'd not, not of the appeal process. It's, it's no. from when the actual award would transpire. Okay. Ms. Corbelet. If we vote in the affirmative on these three elementary school contracts today, when will they go to the IAC? Uh, as promptly as possible. It, the IC schedule has their own scheduling uh, orders just as you do for agenda. So we take them up to Baltimore, we prepare them for introduction at the IC, but then it's up to their uh, executive staff and their uh, governance body to determine when it's docketed. Uh, do they them. meet weekly or monthly or? Um, they meet um, monthly. Thanks. Mr. Granin. Yeah, I, I have a, a non-merits uh, question for the board's council. If these contracts were um, moving forward awarded to CT Electric, would that moot the appeal? If they were awarded to CT Electric? Mm -hmm. Would that moot the appeal? I can't speak for CT Electric's concerns as voiced in their bid protest, and in fact, I've not seen their bid protest, so I can't comment I mean, on it. You do, in fact, have to be 
a loser to have an appeal, right? I, but I'm it, not aware on what conditions they would have to move forward and whether they would still have any sort of claim as to having some sort of loss for the delay, because I don't know what the delay has apparently been in their award. What I do know is that there, there, there is, to my knowledge, notwithstanding what might be pending change in regulation or law, as the law and regulation sits today, there is no de minimis or, or, or um, non-substantive MBE regulation or requirement. Those are those have been around a long time. Minority business enterprise and women-owned business enterprise, small business enterprise uh, um, procedures, and no board of education lightly disregards them. Whether it's about a form or whether it's about uh, you know the content on a form, that is state law, and 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 you as a board are obligated to follow that. In fact, many contractors over the years have bemoaned the fact that they've got to do such paperwork or that their feet were held to the fire on paperwork. And this has nothing to do with CT Electric per se. I'm just telling you that there is an expectation. There was reference to the staff members who are involved in that office. They have direct liaison responsibility to the IAC to enforce MBE rules. So again, at some point in time, those merits, those issues will work their way out. But to answer your question, I would think that if suddenly today uh, a, pro a protesting contractor were to become the awardee, I'm not sure what their harm would be at that point. Mr. Shaknovich, is it unusual for contracts to be disputed by the losing parties? It is not unusual. And many of those are settled before that they would come to a board. That, that may be if there is a dispute that's handled. That, what? I know that's some are and some aren't. I, I, I can't, you know, put a number on it. A lot of it has to do with timing, et cetera. So. so, and I believe before when you've talked to us about procurement and contracts that come up, when someone has, you've stated before, and this is just in general, that when um, people do not receive a contract, your team often meets with that company to go over what deficiencies may be there to help them in the future when they make bids. Is that correct? Absolutely. That's a routine practice that they can go back and how to correct and may, and improve their chances for future contracts as well. Again, yes, that's a routine practice of our uh, purchasing office and our facility division. Okay. So, but currently we have we have very detailed policies and regulations regarding procurement that have been followed through this process and if we were to choose to pull things out or delay things, we'd be going against our own policy. Uh, Madam President, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. I would. The first part of what you said is important. You are obligated, again, unless you unanimously vote to suspend one of your policies, which in itself is one of your policies, that ability to do that. Uh, I would caution against that in the procurement realm in particular because there's an expectation of a certain process. Uh, in this case, uh, as in many of your construction contracts, uh, over a certain dollar amount, these are fully competed projects. So they, they are they're not just two or three folks who submit proposals and then they're subjected to a subjective and objective scoring system. These are blind bids. These folks have a deadline which is submit their paperwork and their bid and their requirement papers. And then everybody's judged from that point forward. And it's important to note, I believe on at least one of the cover sheets, the company that was speaking earlier was not noted as a company with a higher bid and therefore not the lowest responsible responsive bidder, they were in fact disqualified or rejected as a bidder for being non-responsive. And there is a difference. And again, those are the kinds of things that come out in litigation. But if you look at your sheet that Dr. Arlotto submitted to you, you'll, you'll see lists of prices for certain contractors. The law says lowest responsible and responsive bidder. Those are all criteria the law requires. If the staff deems a contractor non-responsive or non-responsible. They may not get to that lowest number issue. So again, I, I caution you, the record in front of you is that the protester in this case was not deemed responsive and or responsible for the number to be even re re reviewed. And that's probably what's at issue in their dispute. Again, have not seen the protest. I'm just telling you based on practice. There are, neither, are there any other board questions or comments? Okay, is there any public comment? Okay. Okay, you've already spoken, ma'am, on this issue. Um, Ms. Connolly, would you call the roll, please, on the motion to unbundle items 4.05 and 4.03? 4.05 and 4.03. Of 
Unbundle 4.05 and 4.13. Ms. Urea? Yay. Yay? Yay. No. No. Mr. Gilliland? No. Mrs. Nally? No. Mr. Reinhardt? No. Mr. Butcher? No. Mr. Granin? Aye. And Ms. Korbelak? No. And Mrs. Hummer? No. Motion fails. The motion fails. Yes. One in the affirmative, seven in the negative. Okay. All right. So, and are there any other comments before we go on to vote? Mr. Reinhardt. Uh, thank you. I did some quick number crunching uh, on first and math. That's what I like to do. So it is a, uh, appears to be a three-year award um, looking at the cost per year at the 725 price per head uh, that does uh, approximately match the number of third through fifth graders uh, that we have enrolled in AACPS. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, now we will vote on the bundled items 4.01 through 4.25, except for the item 4.11 that was removed. Ms. Connolly, would you please call the roll? Ms. Urea? Yes. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mrs. Nally? Yes. Mr. Reinhardt? Aye. Mr. Butcher? Yes. Mr. Granin? Nay. Ms. Korbelak? Yay. <laughs> Ms. Hummer? Yes. <laughs> All right, so the motion passes. Um, one in the affirmative, I mean, one in the negative, seven in, seven the, in affirmative. the affirmative. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shaknovich and Mr. Burns. The next item, 5.01, is administrative personnel appointments, and there are no appointments today. Item 5.02 is personnel. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. I recommend board approval of the actions as stipulated on the attached sheets. Are there any board co questions or comments? Okay. Ms. Connolly, would you call the roll, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I missed. Mr. Reinhardt, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I would like to uh, commend HR for uh, an outstanding uh, job with these appointments. Uh, we're looking at approximately 24% non-white of our 588 hires. And considering that we have um, in Anne Arundel County, our demographics as a, as a whole county are 25% non-white. So in terms of our incoming class, we're matching uh, the folks that are here in the county. We've got a long way to go uh, to get our entire staff there. Uh, but if, if we're looking at, at where we're going so far, this is a, certainly a, a positive move. And that HR has worked tirelessly and hired almost 600 employees, uh, 600 teachers as of today, which is pretty amazing. So thank you all. Where do we sit at vacancies, Ms. Uh, Dr. Arlotto? Uh, in meeting with Ms. Cutches yesterday afternoon, I think the number was 30. Classroom teachers, yes. So anybody watching, please contact HR. We are still on the hunt. So. Ms. Connolly, would you call the roll on this item? Ms. Urea? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mrs. Nally? Aye. Mr. Reinhardt? Aye. Mr. Butcher? Aye. Mr. Granin? Aye. Ms. Ms. Korbelak? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Okay. Next item is policy revisions, third reading, item 5.03 um, is our first one, vehicles prohibited on school policy, on school property. Um, Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. As this is the third reading, I'm recommending the board approval of policy JEJ, -E -J, subject to final correction for style and format. Okay. All, right. All right. Mr. Reinhardt. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, 
have a friendly amendment. Uh, we have two two pieces of language that we'd like to address. So if we look at C2, uh, so I propose that we rework that unless granted written permission by AACPS as identified in subsection one above. Vehicles that pose a reasonable risk of injury are prohibited from AACPS property at all times, including, but not necessarily limited to. So for the record, Jeanette Ortiz, Legislative and Policy Council. So the way um, I draft policy and regulation is consistent with Maryland state law um, and regulations. And so using the word including assumes that it's not li but not limited to, and that's just standard legal law regulatory drafting in the state of Maryland. So that's why I didn't include, but not limited to, because that's included in the statement including. So I've kind of stepped away from that in all of our policies and regulations that okay. had that, because some had that language and some didn't. So for consistency's purposes, we're just using including, which also includes, but not limited to. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> so of, do you of the clarification. Do you withdraw I would, that I would, friendly amendment? I would, yes, I withdraw my amendment uh, okay. on section C2. Now, uh, another piece of language uh, in, in uh, says so another friendly amendment, uh, Madam President, uh, adding a subsection I to C2. So H is watercraft. Uh, and subsection I would then read, vehicles identified to AACPS by law enforcement officials as being stolen or as posing a reasonable risk of injury or threat of harm to the public as determined by law enforcement officials. We don't have any objections to that. Okay. Do I have a second to that motion? Okay, so do I have any questions or comments on that? You, know, you, <laughs> you were ready to go. So, Mr. Batten, you're comfortable with that? For the record, Doyle Batten, Supervisor of Security. Yes, ma'am, I am. So I can't, pa can't park my airplane or my stolen vehicle on school grounds. Correct. <laughs> Yes, permission. Unless I have permission to park my, my helicopter will be out there. Or your stolen helicopter. My stolen helicopter. Yes, in, in memory of Burt Reynolds. <laughs> so are there any board questions or comments on this amendment? Okay. Are there, is there any public comment to this amend, amendment to the policy? Okay. Ms. Connolly, would you call the roll? Ms. Shurea. Mr. Gilliland. Aye. Mrs. Nally. Aye. Mr. Reinhardt. Aye. Mr. Butcher. Aye. Mr. Granin. Aye. Ms. Korbelak. Aye. Mrs. Hummer. Aye. Motion passes eight in positive, zero in the negative. Okay. So next we would that was for the amendment, and now we we need to vote on the policy as amended. For and so um we already have it. So is there any public comment on the policy as amended? Is there any board questions or comments? Okay. Ms. Connolly, call the roll. Ms. Urea? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mrs. Nally? Aye. Mr. Reinhardt? Aye. Mr. Butcher? Aye. Mr. Granin? Aye. Ms. Korbelak? Aye. And Mrs. Hummer? Aye. Motion passes 8-0. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, item 5.04 is public participation, code BCB. This is also a third reading. Dr. Lotto, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. I recommend board approval of policy BCB, subject to final correction for style and format. Okay, is there any board questions or comments regarding this? Okay, we do have um, a, some public comment, Ms. Calhoun. I just want to 
words have meaning and switching this language from participation of the public to comment I think is very telling especially since earlier I brought up the fact that the public's comments and input to the proceedings and the conduct of this board is very difficult at best um, to change the word from participation to comment I think is disingenuous either the public is participating in this board in some fashion and you all need to choose a word that accurately portrays what it means to be a participant in this board or if comment is truly the word then then that so be it but I just recommend that this, this policy is not correct and perhaps you need to do more research on what you really need and want from the public when they attend these meetings and you have public participation in anything for the board. I just want to clarify that these meetings, these public meetings that we have, these are public business meetings of the board. This is the board doing their business in public. It is not a, a public participation time. We welcome public comment, but as we say, it's not really a question and comment time because this is where we are doing our business for people to view. We have many opportunities for um, public participation and, and, and um, for people to give their views and to meet with members. For instance, as I said, the CAC meeting the other night, many of our other things that are open and out there. And so this is just to clarify that during this time it's not usually a, it's not a debate back and forth with um, members of the public at the board meetings there are other opportunities to do that but it is a time where we do take comment that we take and consider seriously so is there any other public comment on this item uh, if I may uh, uh, Ms. Ortiz yes so actually the recommendation to change it to public comment actually came directly from me um, independently because to make it consistent with what's on the agenda which states public comment and it's also consistent with how other public bodies around the state of Maryland operate it's public comment Ms. Schalheim hi there I just wanted to know is this is this the um, the policy around uh, public comment cards having to be in before the agenda is set or is this something different this is something different okay, never mind then. right this is this is a policy on public comment the procedures regarding public comment are posted on the wall over there and those are procedures that are set by the board that can be changed but they're not a official policy but this is the official policy on public comment or to be co public comment all right so miss Connolly, would you call the roll please yes, Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mrs. Nally? Aye. Mr. Reinhardt? Aye. Mr. Butcher? Aye. Mr. Granin? Aye. Ms. Korblak? Aye. Mrs. Hummer? Aye. Motion passes 8 0. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Ortiz. Thank you. All right. Item 5.05 is an information item this is the superintendent's recommended fiscal year 2020 capital budget six-year plan and state capital improvement plan dr arlotto we as the team is assembling we do have brief presentation to review this uh, as the board and to remind the public um, that this information will be at your this will be your the focus of your public workshop tomorrow evening um, to really delve deeply with staff regarding the capital budget with that, Mr. Shacknovich. For the record, Alex Shacknovich, Chief Operating Officer. Lisa Seaman Crawford, Director of Facilities. And we're here uh, to bring item 5.05 .05 to your attention. It is an information item only regarding the superintendent's recommended fiscal year 2020 capital budget, six year plan, and capital improvement plan. This plan is required by uh, operation of state law and IAC procedures to be turned into the interagency committee on school construction no later than October 4th, 2018. Uh, the packet before you is structured to document the superintendent's recommendation for a $172.1 million capital improvement request for 2020. Of that $171.1 172.1 million dollars the superintendent is recommending that 116.6 million be requested of the county with the remaining 55.5 million being requested from the state as the superintendent alluded to just moments ago uh, we've set aside uh, time tomorrow evening at six o'clock here in the boardroom to review the projects in detail we'll go line by line including the cost breakdown the rationale 
the scheduling and the specifics of each project. It's a tremendous opportunity for the board at that time then to uh, get the information required such that they, A, can prepare themselves for the deliberations to be held the following meeting, September the 26th, and also on the September the 26th, a public hearing will be held as part of the agenda item considering uh, the capital improvement uh, program. The workshop tomorrow is open to the public, but public testimony is not taken at that time because explicit time is set aside for a public hearing on the 26th, uh, regularly scheduled board meeting the afternoon of uh, September 26th. With that, we conclude our remarks at this time and look forward to engaging with you tomorrow evening. Okay. All right. Thank you. So um, is, are there any board questions or comments on this item? Okay. The, um, is there any public comment? I do have one card. Jen Brienza. Good morning, Dr. Arlotto, members of the board. My name is Jennifer Brianza, um, and as I'm sure you already know, I'm here on behalf of the Fundo Middle School Construction Group. Um, without knowing, obviously, what's in the budget, I just want to make sure there's some things in the back of your mind as you begin to review Dr. Arlotto's proposal. Obviously, um, you've heard from my group several times before, so I'm not going to rehash all the details, but I want you to keep in the back of your mind that we're still waiting here in Old Mill. We're the last of the 2006 MGT priorities to get funded. Um, Northeast has been finished, Savannah Park's been finished, Crofton popped up in the middle there and um, they're underway. Um, we just want to make sure that you haven't lost sight of what we're waiting for. We're here 12 years later. My daughter was only a year old when Old Mill became a priority and she now just entered the eighth grade and has no shot of attending a new Old Mill, but it's still important to the rest of the community. I also wanted to let you know, as you consider the budget, that my group recently submitted emails to all of the current county council candidates and asked if they supported the Old Mill construction funding for the um, Old Mill Complex Master Plan. The responses we received so far immediately dropped the ball back in your court. They made it a point to let us know it's not up to them, it starts with you. Um, <laughs> now, I'm, we're all aware that the county executive and the county council doesn't fully fund the board's requests, we get that. But it does begin with you, and if you don't make us a priority, they won't either. We know it's a huge project, but delaying it's not gonna make it any easier or less costly. We have to keep moving forward one step at a time, and we'd like you to keep that in mind as you're working through this year's budget. We're still here, we're still waiting, we're watching, we're not going anywhere. Thank you. And I hear ya. Don't worry, I'm with you. <laughs> All right, is there any other public comment? All right. I just wanted to provide additional information to the board members that the, um, the state had done a study on trying to get after a more effective way to get after our capital improvements. I provided some input to that uh, contractor who was, fought, interestingly enough, from Washington State, not from this state. However, I think if we bundle some of our projects, i.e. take a bigger bite of the ele elephant and try and get our um, use of uh, economies of scale and drive our costs down, that we might be able to get after some of these products by doing more of them. It maybe sounds counterintuitive, but if bricks, if you buy more bricks, they're less. Um, I asked that contractor to look at that as a method to try and figure out if we could get more done with the same amount of money by buying buying more basically the physical products to didn't go into the buildings and I honestly I don't think that was part of their study so again I'm telling you people have ideas to solve these problems and we can't get them into the process for consideration so I wanted to share that with you as I've listened to old Mel talk for quite a while and everybody says we can't solve this problem and this is the information age we can solve these problems together Mr. Gilliland. Uh, Dr. Arlotto, would it be okay if I can just, I, I know we will delve deeply tomorrow night, but Mr. Shaknovich, if I could just ask uh, one question uh, along those lines. The, 
Thank you again, um, and, and and certainly, you know, I've I've got a list of questions in, in preparation of tomorrow night. But, but just to clarify a, a statement that was just made, it, it's we have to abide by state law when we purchase by way of line item, correct? Yes, sir. So we cannot buy stacks of bricks and just have them on standby for other schools. The state will not allow us to do that, even if we want it to. Is that correct? So. By way of background, the uh, state recently concluded a, a two-year effort uh, led by Martin Knott, uh, the Knott Commission, uh, formerly it was called the 21st Century School Commission, that arrived at uh, about three dozen uh, sets of recommendations for the state in order to update and uh, the school construction regulations, the procurement regulations regarding same and bring some additional efficiencies uh, and opportunities to school districts. That is making its way through the legislature slowly. Part of it got adopted in this last cycle. Some more of it will get adopted in the next cycle. The IAC is in the process of writing the rules and the procedures uh, regarding the recently adopted legislation. So the, the tools that this will bring um, to the localities, to the 24, I think, are critical as we go forward, as we try to uh, procure and deliver projects more efficiently and more rapidly. Uh, so things like bundling contracts, things like uh, procuring uh, more aggressively in terms of economies of scale, those are going to be new tools in LEA's toolboxes. But again, until both the, the uh, COMAR is changed and then the IEC adopts the new procedures. It's only after that that we can begin deploying some of these. And they are being rolled out, and as they are being rolled out and have effective dates established, then my facilities and purchasing unit are rapidly adapting to be able to utilize these new, new tools. And I, and I appreciate what the, the prior speaker had, had been saying, because I, I do think we can uh, benefit from the economies of scale, but um, we need to wait for this to become fully uh, executed from the state and then also from the IAC through the regulatory process. That's absolutely correct. And again, as, as, as each and every one of these are rolled out, you know, we're aware, we're following the IAC, we're participating in their deliberations. Uh, as they are adopted with an effective date, it is on or after that date that we, be, and only on or after that effective date that we can begin utilizing these new tools. And, and then one final follow-up, if, if I may, um, the, the not I know Kerwin is moving uh, in, in this direction as well, but is it your understanding that the not Commission, um, uh, the final aspects of the not Commission would come through this uh, upcoming session of the General Assembly, so we will know by the second Monday in April what, what that final uh, report will look like after the, the committees in both the House and the Senate and the, the legislature as a whole uh, agrees or, or adds to it or changes in, in any way, shape, or form? So the, uh, the not Commission's uh, work uh, was completed in December of 2017. The full report was issued to the Governor and the two presiding officers. They did, in this past session, the General Assembly did take up significant pieces of legislation that substantively adopted many, but not all, many of the recommendations that came out of the not commission. Those are going through the rules and procedure process now after adoption. There were some elements that the General Assembly either was not prepared to fully take up or wanted more information on or were not in agreement with. So some of those other elements, a smaller subset, so the vast majority of the recommendations in the not commission did in fact get adopted this past cycle there's a small subset that can be brought back for reconsideration come January. Thank you for that. And I apologize. It seems like whoever ends up speaking, there's a fly that has been bouncing to whoever's speaking up here or whoever's speaking down there. So the whole time you've been talking, this fly has been circling your head. So, so thank you. If I, if I was smiling, it wasn't because of what you were saying. It was the fly. So. <laughs> And I was not trying to ignore you. I was trying to ignore the fly. So. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Shaknovich. All right. Item 5.06 is um, Crofton Middle School deed of easement. Um, Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. I recommend board approval of the Crofton Middle School deed of easement. Do I have a second? All right. 
Are, are there any board questions or comments about this easement? Okay. Is there any public comment? All right. Ms. Connolly, would you call the roll? Ms. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Reinhardt. Aye. Mr. Butcher. Aye. Mr. Grannon. Aye. Ms. Korbelak. Aye. And Mrs. Hummer. Aye. Motion passes 8-0. Okay. All right. Thank you. Item 6.01 is a review item award of contracts. And are there any board questions or comments regarding any of these items? Is there any public comment? Okay. So with that, we have completed our... No? I don't think so. No. So with that, we have concluded our um, business for the day. The next general board meeting will be Wednesday, September 26th, here in the boardroom at 7 p.m. Tomorrow night at 6 p.m. is the FY 2020 Capital Improvement Plan and Capital Budget. The public is welcome to attend, but there will be no public comment. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. Move. Do I have a second? second? All those in favor? There we go. Meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.